Hello and welcome to uh, March 2nd uh, Philadelphia SMPTE webinar. Um, today, Sony is going to uh, present to us on their uh, XCAM Air. Um, with us in this conference is uh, Jimmy Tan. He's our local uh, Sony representative. And presenting today will be Martin Lindsay. Um, and this will be a presentation, X XCAM Air, an ENG production workflow. So Martin Lindsay has over 19 years of broadcast experience uh, with a wealth of knowledge pertaining to many aspects in the broadcast industry. He joined Sony in 2008, he designed and built multiple production and automated master control rooms for TV stations, sports facilities, leading up to his current role today as project product manager of wireless and workflow solutions. He currently manages Sony's wireless video streaming products and technologies, the NG camcorders and Sony's integrated production systems. Uh, with that, um, Martin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks. And I want to add one more person that we brought in as well, our uh, uh, support sales, our system sales engineer, um, Joseph Peretzman. So he's actually got a few of our cameras uh, running that we're going to be demonstrating on the system today. Uh, and he's located in Detroit. I'm in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and I'll be showing you the demonstration, obviously, from, from my house today. Uh, and I have a few cameras also set up in, in my house as well that we're going we're gonna to show you. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. Uh, can you see my screen? You should see a powering creativity screen. Yep. Awesome. Okay. If I can see it. Perfect. Okay. So uh, the idea today is I'm not going to spend too much time discussing or going through um, slides. I really want to kind of jump into the, the user interface itself and really give you a, a hands-on demonstration of what this system can do and how it can improve workflows, um, particularly for ENG and also production as well. So we're just going to jump into a few slides at the beginning here just to give you a high-level overview of, um, of uh, what the system entails. So to start, we've got the wireless camcorder lineup. So there's a whole wide range of Sony cameras that are supported by what we're talking about today, which is XD Cam Air. Uh, XD Cam Air is Sony's cloud-based service um, that allows you to uh, transfer files to the cloud or transfer files to FTP. It gives you remote access of media within the camera. and also gives you remote control of the cameras as well. So a wide range of cameras um, from our entry levels all the way up to our flagship uh, cinemat cinemat uh, cinematic cameras, such as the FX9 um, and the FS7 cameras, uh, as well as the handheld news cameras, the typical ENG cameras like the PXW Z280, which is our flagship um, handheld model now, as well as our uh, shoulder mount cameras. So these cameras have different ways of connecting to the internet, essentially. Um, some of them have built-in Wi-Fi for 2.4 and 5 gig connectivity, and others would need, such as our shoulder mount cameras, a, an external dongle, essentially, that will give you that Wi-Fi connection. Um, and some of them also have a RJ45 connection that you can plug in uh, directly into a hardwired uh, network. Um, and any of the cameras that don't have a hardwired connection, you have the option to use a USB to uh, um, RJ45 connector. What's important to note is we also have a free application it's called Content Browser Mobile. This device allows you to locally access media and uh, remotely control the camera, set up uh, settings in the camera, and, and manage media within that camera using a mobile device, such as a journalist might use or a photographer might use at the, uh, at the scene. So uh, again, the, the, uh, the important thing with these cameras, again, is the fact that they do the, the transfers directly from the cameras, and they also do streaming. So they will do an H.264 or an H.265 stream, depending on the camera model, um, HEVC, uh, and that is done all with the encoding that's built into these specific cameras. Uh, and we're going to talk about that as we kind of go through the slides here. Now, Sony doesn't offer uh, cellular connectivity in terms of uh, data. Uh, that is done essentially through uh, your carrier. Um, you would manage that, uh, that data plan. So you bring uh, essentially a USB LTE dongle or a MiFi device or a hotspot essentially that these cameras would then connect to and, and utilize those, those data um, connections. Moving to the next uh, slide here, I want to just kind of introduce you into uh, or to our CBKWA100. This is a small little um, encoder, essentially. It's about four inches by four inches, but about an inch thick. 
And this is for adding onto your legacy devices. So for example, if you didn't have any one of the cameras that we previously showed in that, that slide, um, this will allow you to take anything that has an SDI output to then stream it. Um, so this has streaming built into it. This particular box does a H.264 stream. It also will do local proxy recording for you. So it'll do proxy records 1920 up to 1920, 1080 at nine megabits per second locally on an SD card that goes in there. And it also has two USB slots that'll allow you to connect up to two uh, dongles. So you can actually do dual link, which I'm gonna explain in, in a couple more slides here. And dual link is essentially um, bonding. Uh, Sony calls it dual link. So that way you can have two carriers, whether it be, for example, AT&T and Verizon, both connected, both uh, being utilized to bring that stream back from, from the field. Um, and then the FS7 has a build-up kit available as well. So the, the, with the FS7, you can put a build-up kit on the back of it and turns it more into an ENG style camera. Um, and that adds the ability to do um, QoS streaming, which is Sony's streaming, um, with again, dual link or a hardwired Ethernet connector. And the FX9 also has built in uh, Wi Fi. So, with the built in Wi Fi, you can tether this to a hotspot or a Wi Fi device. But, and, you can ask, and you can also add an extension unit if you want to do the dual link connection, again, like bonding, um, as well if you want an RJ45 hardwired connection. So, those are all the devices really to, to get you connected to what we're going to show you today with XD Cam Air. And we also have the ability to use your Android or uh, iOS device as well. So with that, you can download a free application. It's called XDCAM Pocket. Uh, anybody can download it. It's completely free. And, and then you can stream to uh, XDCAM Air Cloud, which can also then stream to a physical receiver. So all the cameras, uh, as well as this Android device or iOS device, can stream to uh, a cloud receiver or a virtual receiver which can then provide RTMP outputs to an endpoint of your choice. And we can also stream to a, a physical receiver. And the physical receiver uh, I'm going to talk about in more detail here is a 1RU receiver uh, that will would reside at a broadcast facility um, if you wish to have uh, baseband SDI outputs um, from this device. So the lowest latency right now um, with XD camera is actually 1.5 seconds from the stream from the camera to the SDI output on this receiver. Um, but uh, we're working on a 0 0.7 second delay coming out very soon um, for, for this service. So we're cutting the latency down by half and, of course, ensuring high quality uh, streaming as well. So this is a physical receiver that we're, and we're going to show you a physical receiver today. Is uh, We have one at uh, Joe's house and we also have one in our San Jose lab um, where we're going to demonstrate some streams uh, from our cameras. Um, just quickly jumping to the actual connections of the cameras and the different connection options. Um, for some of the cameras you can that have two USB slots, you can plug in two USB LTE dongles into those particular cameras, and that will get you to your dual link connectivity. Uh, some of the shoulder mount cameras are limited to a single USB connector. So what we have here is a dual link, or sorry, a dual USB adapter essentially that mounts to the back of the camera here and will allow you to connect again uh, to USB LTE dongles as well. So that can get, give you that dual connection for, for those shoulder mount cameras. And then of course the build-up kit for the FS7 and the, the WA100 that we talked about, the little four inch by four inch box here, that's just a demonstration of it being connected to two cellular, cellular connections as well. And again, this doesn't have to be connected to a Sony camera. It can be connected, of course, to anything that has an SDI output. So you could be taking this out of a switcher, perhaps uh, in a remote field or remote production, and, uh, and, and sending that back to your station. And of course, these are then um, equally sent among the two uh, streams, or sorry, the two connections, the two LTE connections. And of course, if one goes down or is healthier than the other, it's automatically going to balance uh, actively the data among both of those uh, connections back to your receiver. So this is my last slide. Um, again, I just kind of want to give you a high level of XD Cam Air. So again, what we can do is the camera control. We can manage and route live streams. Um, so we can stream uh, uh, feeds or streams or so live streams for live or live video from cameras to multiple receivers at multiple locations or single receivers, depending on your needs, as well as ability to remotely view and transfer camera files. So I'm going to show you that as well. We can, we can, it's really neat because we can actually look at the media in the camera and play that media back from the camera before you even decide to transfer the media out of that, the, out of the, the camera. And that can be done when the camera is recording as well. 
We also have an ability to do storyboard editing, which I'll show you in the cloud as well. So you can do a storyboard edit in the cloud of all the proxy files that were um, sent up from the cameras. Um, and, uh, and then we also have the ability to do RTMP stream outputs as well from the cloud. And then Sony C, I'm not sure if you've been introduced to C or not, but Sony C is um, basically like a Dropbox on steroids. It's really made for production and news and media uh, environments. Uh, so you can do a lot of powerful things with this with RTMP capture and logging. You can do storage and archiving. Um, you can do a lot of collaboration and shared folders and things like that. And that's a whole nother um, discussion in itself. But again, this kind of just shows the ecosystem of our cameras, the ability to transfer to XD Cam Air, have XD Cam Air manage the media within cameras and transfer to C as an example, which is a cloud media uh, asset management uh, service essentially, as well as the ability to do an FTP transfer. So the cameras do have the ability to do FTP and FTPS transfers. If you want to transfer directly from that camera, back to a FTP site that you might have already set up at your at your facility. So that's it for the slides. If there's any questions, please feel free to stop me as we go through. Um, let me just move this out of the way here. Uh, this is my Adobe. So I'm going to share the login. I think I've timed out here. Okay, so this is basically XD Camera. When you log in, there's a few tabs at the top here. You can see live planning, asset transfer, and settings. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through these in order. Um, and the first one here is live. So essentially what we see here is our transmitter, dev our transmission devices. So we have transmitter here. This shows all our cameras that are currently available and connected to XT Camera. Um, and basically what this is, is it's a, it's a thumbnail that updates every two or three seconds just to give you an idea of the status of what's going on at the scene uh, at any given time. We then have our receivers at the bottom here. So these are our physical receivers or our cloud receivers. So my first one here is actually a cloud receiver. So we can create multiple cloud receivers, which would allow us to stream, drag and drop a stream to a cloud receiver, which would then be configured uh, to provide RTMP um, endpoints to, for example, Facebook Live or YouTube Live, if you wanted to do that. These ones here are physical receivers. So this is Joe's receiver in his uh, basement in Detroit. Um, one receiver does two SDI outputs. So you can have up to two simultaneous streams from one receiver. Uh, if you needed more, you could add another receiver as well. And then this is our um, our receiver in San Jose that I was mentioning. So this is uh, output one and output two. And if you want to start and stop the uh, stream, um, you basically drag and drop the camera to um, the output that you want uh, to stream. And the beauty with this, of course, is the fact that uh, you know it's doing it directly from the camera, so you don't need any external encoders, um, you know, in between. So again, this is a this is a low latency stream in about uh, 1 1.5 uh, 1 1.5 seconds currently. It'll be streaming from here to the SDI output uh, on the receiver, and uh, and then you'll see a monitor window here uh, that'll give you the status, the live status of uh, of that that camera. Um, we also have the ability to do. Uh, actually, I'm just I'm going to stop that one second. I just want to show you um, the ability to do the settings before you start a stream. So. In here under the streaming tab, what we can do is we can set the codec here depending on the camera. So you can do it to H.264 and H.265. Uh, again, this is dependent on the camera model um, that's, uh, that's supported. Um, everything supports H.264 in terms of any uh, capable connected camera from, from Sony, but H.265 is more so catered to the newest, newest cameras. We can also set our delays as well. So we can do a delay here, very long, 10 second delay, for example, which basically allows you to have more buffering um over public internet connections uh so you know if you're not doing talking heads or interviews you could you could definitely set a longer delay and uh, have less um uh, potential issues if there's uh, network problems um so this again we're is 1.5 seconds and we're reducing this down to 0 0.7 seconds very soon you also have the option to do a main output here so this is where i was saying you can stream to uh, multiple or single receivers so i can stream to for example uh Joe's receiver, and then I can do sub outputs. So sub outputs, I can I can stream to multiple other receivers that you might have at different stations or different locations. Um, so that's kind of neat that we can do that as well. Um, it's important to note that the stream 
uh, never goes to the cloud. The stream, well, the, sorry, I shouldn't say never. The stream always goes directly from the camera to the receiver first, uh, the physical receiver, if, you, if you're using a physical receiver. And that's, of course, to keep the latency low. So it keeps it out of the cloud. It does the stream directly from camera to receiver. Um, and then what the receiver will do is the receiver will push up any feeds to, to the cloud if you're doing, for example, a, um, a cloud uh, stream or a cloud record. Um, but important again, important to note that camera goes uh, directly back to to the uh, to the receiver. We also have so our next tab under the live here is the remote. So we have the ability to do camera remote control. Uh, it's not really uh, much of uh, any paint functions, but essentially you get to do the basic remote control in terms of zoom, focus, gain, iris control, and white balance as well. So uh, I can click on my camera here. Martin, uh, actually, let's click on here, and uh, I can do a zoom, so I can focus. Sorry, I'm going to zoom in here, and you'll see the thumbnail update in a couple seconds, and you'll see the zoom, so you can see what we've done in terms of zooming in there. I can also do it for live, so we can do it for Joe's camera here, and I can zoom in on his camera. It's a little more delayed because, again, remember the camera by the time you see it on the on the window here, because by the time the stream goes to the receiver. Uh, and then is sent up to the cloud. It's a little more delayed in terms of the live, uh, the live window in in this stream here. Actually, I'm not sure why it's not updating right now. It's probably my internet connection. Why it's no, updated. actually, I think it's not updating because I turned off the servo and I have to go turn it back on again. Oh, okay. So let me go take care of that. I'll do it right now. Okay. So he's put it into manual mode. That's why I can't maybe adjust that one. Anyways, um, so yeah, if the camera, obviously the lens has to be set into into uh, auto mode, so you can do that remote control. Um, you can do also do record, start and control, start and stop as well. So if the camera is on sticks, for example, and you want to do a remote start, you could do that. You can definitely do a record and a record stop. And I'm going to show you that in a couple of minutes uh, after we do some planning metadata setup. Uh, we also have the option to see GPS, so we can see the the physical location of where that camera was is active or where it was last active. So you can see my address is here. Um, and then you can also do a map view here in terms of uh, allowing to uh, see where any of these cameras are located at any given time. Um, I see Joe's here. Yeah, there's Joe. Uh, this can be enabled or disabled. It comes actually as disabled as default in the cameras uh, when you get them from factory. But you would enable the GPS within the camera and then you have the, the ability to do the monitoring, which which can be very handy for uh, for news essentially when you're trying to deploy a camera to uh, you know to a to a breaking news story you want to find the person who's closest to that that story. So that's really in a nutshell the the live portion of the of the of the cameras. Uh, just again the different models we have here are a PXLV Z280 that's our, our handheld. We have an X400 which is a shoulder mount. Uh, we have Z750, which is a shoulder mount, and then we also have uh, this is the Xperia Pro, so Joe's phone essentially with the XT Cam Pocket that's streaming into uh, into the receiver. So right now he's got two cameras here that are streaming, uh, Joe here, uh, which are streaming to his physical receiver at his at his home. Um, clicking on the streaming tab, you can also see the the bit right here. So right now I can see that he's connected to uh, wireless LAN. And he's streaming at about seven megabits per second. So uh, we can stream all the way down to about half a megabit per second before you lose the, the signal. Um, audio will always be in sync with the video. A uh, typical good stream is anywhere between about five and eight megabits per second. You'll still get pretty good streaming at four and three megabits. And then when you get down to about two, you're going to see a little more noticeable uh, difference in terms of quality. But an average stream for us is anywhere between um, maybe about six and eight megabits per second, and it'll max up to 12 megabits as well. It's variable variable bit rate, uh, so you know if you put color bars on or there's no noise or a little movement in the um, in the video, it will uh, it will um, drop to very low bit rate to, to save bandwidth. So um, the next tab is planning. So in the planning tab, this essentially allows uh, us to access the story names uh, and, and information and metadata from your user and computer system. Uh, so two examples we have here are, are iNews and uh, ENPS as well. So for example, with iNews, uh, let's see if there's any popular here. So let's go to ENPS. So ENPS, so I'm gonna use the ENPS system that we've got. Essentially when the news writer creates a story, 
you can have the metadata populated or the storage log um, sent from from the using computer system via MOS protocol to a gateway server that essentially sits at the station, which then sends this information up into MTK Mirror. Um, so the second that you see, uh, or sorry, sorry, the second that that story is created, it would be populated up here. Uh, and then within XT Camera, you have the ability to then push the story name to any one of your cameras or multiple cameras. We are working on the next version to automate this process. So essentially, when you create story slugs or story name story names within your using computer system, they can automatically be pushed to a preset defined number of cameras. So for example, if you're creating 10 or 12 stories for the day and you have three camera operators that are going to shoot um, these stories, you can push out all 12 of these stories to the camera operators. And then when the camera operator gets to that location or is going to start shooting the story, they just load that particular story name. And by loading the story name, that essentially will allow them to record the file based on the story name. So when the file or the clip is recorded, it's going to record as the story name dash 001, dash 002 for the second one, 003 for the third one. So that means that when you bring that in back into the production system or you bring that media back into your, your editor, you know what it's associated with rather than it just being a random uh, clip name. Uh, we can also create that uh, locally here. So we can do a local, and I'm going to demonstrate this to you. So we can create a local story name, and that's done in, in this user interface here. I can go to plus, and we can create one called, let's call it Simpty. Okay, so we've created a story name called Simpty. And now I have the option to send this Simpty story name out to any one of the cameras. And in this case, I'm going to send it out to Joel's camera. Okay. So I'm going to I've clicked Simpty. I've clicked, click, clicked on um, Joe's camera here, and I'm going to click Assign. So basically what we're doing now is we're pushing that story name out into his camera. Once that's done, Joe now has the option to load that story name, um, or we can go into his camera for him and load it. So right now we're looking into Joe's camera in Detroit, and it's going to give us all the planning metadata or the stories that are available to load. So right now I can see that Hello is loaded on his camera. I can actually use click on Simpty and load this. So this is now going to be the active story or the active, um, uh, yeah, the active story that he's going to start recording. So what will happen on his E280 now is in the viewfinder, it's going to say Simpty. And the first file that's going to record it will be Simpty-001, 002, 003 as you um, start recording. And I can demonstrate this to you by um, doing a record. So we can go to Joe's camera, okay? And I'm going to click on his camera. And, and and this is being this is being done as he's streaming. So he's streaming. While he's streaming, we can then go to remote, and I can start a record. So now, when I click restart, record start here, it's starting to record locally on his camera. And you can see the little red dot there where it's starting to record. Then I'm going to stop. Okay. Once we're done that, we can go into our next tab here, uh, transfer. Once we go to transfer tab, I can choose his camera. See, he's uh, his camera's here, PXWZ280 Joe. Click on here. And I can see all the media in his camera. So that's the that's the story we just created, or the file that we just recorded, um, literally seconds ago. So all in a matter of a few seconds, we were able to create a story name, send that out to his camera, load it into his camera, do a record, and now have that uh, Simti uh, file ready to play back. So we can play that back locally from his camera, uh, and we can start a proxy transfer and a high-res transfer. So it's important to note that the cameras um, support, most of the cameras support the high-res um, recording on one type of media and a uh, lower bit rate record on, which we call proxy, on a on an SD card, for example. So for example, on his 280, his uh, MXF files, the high-res 50 megabit, 35 megabit, whatever you're doing, XAVC files um, are being recorded uh, onto his S by S cards and the proxy files are being recorded onto the SD card simultaneously. So this gives us access to both C uh, and transfer either the proxy or the high res. Um, and what I can do is, again, this we're looking into his camera. So all this is the media on his camera. It's important to note that also we can't delete any of this. So the only person who can actually uh, modify or delete this content is, is Joe himself, the actual camera operator. So as a remote, um, uh, operator looking into this camera. We don't have any deletion uh, rights. So I can choose now to play this media. So when I click play, 
it's going to play it back from his camera. Now, this might be a bit slower right now because we are still streaming from his camera. His camera is still streaming. He's still streaming to a receiver. Um, but it's showing you what you can do as the cameras are stream streaming. We've done a record remotely, and now we can play this back. I can play this clip back um, as the camera continues to, to stream. So you can see that here. I'm going to go back to live. I'm just going to jump back to the live tab here. And, uh, and you can see his camera is still streaming here, PXLZ280. Now, the only time you would have to stop the streaming is if you want to transfer files. So the only thing the camera will not do is, is, is transfer any files while the camera is streaming, um, just because it's allocating all the bandwidth uh, essentially for that stream. So what I'm going to do is just stop this camera now from streaming and go back into the transfer tab. And give me a sec here. Go back to the transfer tab, go back into his camera, and I can select his clip, and then I can do a proxy transfer. So if I do a proxy transfer, you can predefine the proxy transfer to be set to any location, but in this case, it's going to our cloud. So uh, we can go to the job list, and you can see it's transferring. It shows you the bit rate that it's transferring at. Right now, 14 megabits per second, 15 megabits per second. And the transfer will be completed in a, in a second here. We then have the ability to see in our asset tab the content that was just pushed up. So if I go to our asset tab here, we can see his clip here. So that's the one that we just created, SIMTI 001 S003. So that, now what that means is it's been transferred from his camera. This is the proxy file, the nine megabits per second, 19, 20, 10, 80. It's been transferred from his camera into the cloud. So now we have access in the cloud. So I can click on here, and, or so I can double click it here. I'm double click. And I can play it back. So if I play it back, I think my internet's a bit slower here, but I can play this back and the clip plays back um, right away, essentially. Um, from there, I can jump into creating a storyboard. Um, so what I can do here is I can say, let's create a storyboard from this clip. All right, so I can do create new. Um, I'm going to call this one, let's just call this new, we'll call it SIMTI. And I'm going to show you why we want to do this. Once the storyboard is created, we can open that storyboard and we can trim clips. Uh, and let me just double click on here. And when you want, and when you trim the clips, what you can do is you can do a partial tree. So I can drag more clips onto here, or what I can do is uh, I'm going to go back to here and see if I can add another clip. Uh, one sec here. Uh, I'm going to see if I add another clip here. Where did they put it? Here, I think it was. Oh, assets. Okay, so what I can do is I can drag uh, another clip that he did earlier. So I can drag this clip onto here. Did I drag it? Oh, hang on. I think my internet connection is suffering a bit here. Uh, here, let me try and drag another clip here. Okay. So here, I've dragged another clip, two clips. I can trim the clips. Right, and once you've done that, what you can do is you can click on the export. So in the export, what I can do is I can export the EDL along with the clips. So this is where I have the option to choose um, the ability to uh, uh, send an EDL out to the editor of your choice. In this case, we could choose Avid Media Composer, for example. Then you can choose the delivery type. By that, what this means is you can send out the EDL that you created here, i.e. the two clips that we just um, uh, shortened here. And you can send out the EDL with the proxies, so i.e. the proxy files that we had already retrieved from the camera. Or you can do the EDL with high res. And by that, what we mean is partial retrieve. So we're going to partially retrieve only the media that we need out of that camera. So what you've done is you've done an edit here, a storyboard edit. We're then going to pull out uh, and send an EDL file to an FTP server or to the Sony uh, cloud, such as Sony C, 
where your editors would have access. Um, and then we're going to also transfer only the material that's required for that edit that we um, created in here. So you're doing a partial chief of uh, perhaps like a 60 minute uh, piece or 60 minute clip. You might have only needed 10 seconds from it. Instead of having to push that whole clip back, we can do just a partial retrieve of that. So you can also do a pre and post roll, let's say for three seconds, you choose your destination. So I can choose what FTP server I want to go to. In this case, I can go to C Martin. And then you can and then you can transfer it. So after that, um, basically, so the only reason this isn't going to work right now is because I clicked one of the clips that's uh, that's on Joe's 750 that he doesn't have a high res media in there right now, so it's not going to pull any high res. So that would then give you that EDL and the partial retrieve high res clips um, that can be then opened in your media composer by your local editor. So that's that's really the benefits of doing the, the cloud-based control or the cloud-based uh, storyboard editing. And it's important also to note that you can set in the cameras here. So we manually transferred the, the proxy material um, uh, from his camera. So what we did here is we clicked here and we did proxy. You can also set if you can afford the bandwidth. Uh, for example, if you're at a you know at a location where you're hardwired or you're on Wi-Fi, you can set the cameras to automatically push the proxy files as soon as the clips are done. So that means that as soon as that clip's recorded, you have immediate access to the material that was shot from any particular camcorder. Um, this is typically used a lot by the digital teams. So in the news, of course, they want the high res uh, material back to the station so they can get that back via the traditional news delivery uh, for six o'clock, 11 o'clock news, for example. Um, but at the same time, what they can do is they can automatically have the cameras push the proxy files up to a, a FTP server or a cloud where the digital team has immediate access to that and they can start creating stories and teasers, et cetera, for the digital platform. And you can, if nine megabits per second is too high, you can also set that lower. So your digital team only needs three megabits per second or two megabits or whatever it is they need. You can adjust the, the settings locally on, on the camera. So that can be, that can essentially be automated. Um, I want to also show you the ability to uh, integrate with Adobe Premiere. So this is Adobe Premiere, and what we've got with Adobe Premiere is a plugin. Okay, so there's an XD Camera plugin with an Adobe Premiere um, editor here, and this essentially allows us to see any of the media that was uh, uploaded from the camera to the XD Camera Cloud. Uh, and again, like I said, you could have that completely automated. So your editor here could be seeing all the media that's being automatically transferred from the cameras uh, at any station or any facility and have immediate access to the clips on those cameras. From there, what you can do is select the clip that you want to use uh, and download it. So now we're going to download it essentially into our uh, Adobe Premiere locally here. So I'm downloading it from the cloud. Here, you'll see here. Uh, and It'll go into our bin, so it's importing the files right now. And so this is our this is our SMPTE file that we created, and then I can drag and drop it into our timeline here. And then of course you can do your editing uh, as you need or see fit. You can add other clips, we could trim it, do whatever you want to do, play it back. Um, the Cool benefit here as well is to be able to do a high res transfer. See, so it says now start high res transfer. So if you've got multiple clips in here um, from Joe's camera, uh, I could do another one, but if you've got multiple clips in here at the same time, what you can do is then do a start a high res transfer. It's going to basically ask us where we want to send the high res clip now. So we're going to send it to our FTP server. Uh, Sony C, we could do, actually I'm not sure if this one's set up. And when I send it there, it's essentially sending that high-res clip now from his camera directly to our FTP server in the cloud or your local FTP server. So I'm not sure if Jill's got this one set up or not, so it might not. Oh, there it goes, 13%. And then after that, you can do a conform. So after the, so step one here is we've edited the media. Um, I'm gonna hide this. We've edited the media. We've pulled the media essentially from the cloud into our bin, dragged it into our editor or to our uh, timeline. We've edited the clips that we need. As an editor, we could have exported this just using the MP4s, the proxy files that were recorded, and that would be fine for for your um, 
for your uh, your digital teams. Um, you then also have the option, as we did here, to download the um, partial retrieve directly from the camera and then do a conform into here. Okay, so that if we download it now, this is where it's asking for the information. So what we had done there is we we transferred the partial retrieve from the camera to our FTP server, and now we would have to download it from our FTP server. Once you do that, it'll conform the clip into uh, your your high res version, essentially of the low res edit that you did within Adobe. Sorry, that sounds confusing, but we can definitely review uh, with any questions that you might have uh, following the the demonstration here. So once you go into the settings tab, um, there's a whole bunch of different settings that you can do within within here. And this is where we set up our FTP server settings. So we can set up different FTP server settings. Uh, and essentially, this is all managed within XD Cam Air, And then the information is pushed into the cameras in terms of where the cameras need to send their uh, their FTP information or their, or their clips to based on the FTP settings or credentials that you had set up. So for example, this is my, my FTP server that I've got set for our C services or our C cloud and uh, and I can and I can manage and, and adjust these as needed and assign them to your users. And of course you have all the the group you can create different groups, you can uh, create different users, add different or subtract or remove users depending on their rights as well. So you can obviously have different rights in terms of whether they have the ability to start and stop streams or just view streams, etc. All of that can be done uh, within here as well. Another neat feature is the backup and restore setting. So the backup and restore setting essentially allows you to back up the all file from the cameras and restore it to uh, cameras of the same uh, same model. So you can see the different cameras that we've got here. So for Joe's camera, uh, we could do a backup. You know, I could back up his. I could just call it Simti. Oops, Simti today and create uh, oh I think it doesn't don't like the space sorry Cinti today to create oh Cinti today and so we'll create a uh, backup of his camera uh, and then we could push that out to multiple cameras uh, of the same model so essentially I could load that into I could use his configuration and then load it into my cameras. So my cameras here, I could do a restore and I could restore based on any of the previous backups that I'd done for my camera, um, you know, or, or any of the, uh, where's the Simti one here? Or oops, Simti, wait, let me get it here. Where's the Simti? Or I can load the Simti. So if I, if I do restore, essentially what I'm doing is taking the all file that was, um, retrieve from from Joe's camera and restore it into my camera. So this can be helpful for troubleshooting if you have uh, camera issues and you're not sure if it's the settings in the camera, you can take default uh, backups that you might have set or saved and restore them to cameras. So what we've seen this, uh, of course, recently is a lot of live production, of course, being at home, having the ability to plug the camera directly into an ethernet connection and do uh, you know, stream talent directly from from the talent's home without the need to um, tie up a, an expensive uh, external uh, backpack or transmission device. So that's been a, a key a key feature for for the functionality that's built into the cameras, um, as well for production teams that we've been seeing the planning metadata being able to name send multiple cameras out to talent, for example, who are out in the field um, who may not know how to use the camera. Uh, and that may be the same for talent, or same for uh, news talent as well, or journalists who may not know how to use the camera. You can essentially send it out um, and do any kind of your basic remote control remotely through the live tab. You can uh, you can do planning, uh, naming of the files in the cameras. So uh, any records that are done locally in those cameras will make sense when they're brought back into the production system. Um, so they relate to 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 the stories that have been shot, as opposed to having to try to figure out later on. Uh, after uh, after the, the material has been ingested or, or transferred. Um, and of course, the remote transfer has been a huge, huge feature as well, again, for production teams who have done a production remotely and they want to instantly look at that material or they want to start transferring material back from those cameras to start editing. Of course, you can do that instantly um, as soon as that material is shot. We're looking at growing file support. Um, I think around 
fall timing. So we'll be able to access groin files where you'd be able to set in the cameras. And again, it's, it's going to be specific on the camera model. But for example, in the 280, you'd have the ability to set the, the chunking size, essentially, of the files that would be recorded. Um, so you could do maybe 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes, depending on your, your needs. And essentially, then you'd have access to those growing files. Um, so you wouldn't have to wait for a 60 minute record to stop before you have uh, access to that material. So I think that's, that's in a nutshell what, what we can do with this. Um, again, key benefits are the fact that uh, a lot of people already have the cameras. Um, and if you've already have the camera, you're, you're really halfway there. Um, because so much of this is really built into into those cameras uh, already, and uh, you know you just you add the the service to this and you can start your streaming right away. We've also seen a lot of benefit in terms of um, you know adding this on to existing um, providers that you're already using, such as TVU, LiveU, and Digero. Those are all still obviously really good solutions, and they work very well and very reliably. Um, we've also found that a lot of our customers, for example, don't necessarily have a backpack for each one of their operators. So this really gives them the option now to, to use their Sony cameras, essentially, to start streaming back to the station without having to uh, worry about having the backpack available or assigned to them at any particular time. Because essentially with the 280, for example, or any one of these cameras, we could just tether it to a phone and start streaming. Now, we don't necessarily recommend a phone because sometimes when you get a phone call, that could definitely um, compromise the, the quality of the stream. Um, but if you have a Wi-Fi device or a MiFi device or Wi-Fi network, you could start uh, streaming back that way without having, again, to worry about um, having a backpack assigned or available to you. So we found it's been a very, very good uh, solution for, you know, along with uh, with the backpack solutions as well. Uh, so I think that's about it. Is there any, any questions? Ask a question. Absolutely. Um, when you play the media from the camera, you you talked about how you can get that even before it's been transferred out. W mm -hmm. What resolution is that? Is that the like the proxy resolution, or is it something different? Yeah, that would be the proxy resolution that's set in the camera. So in this case, our proxy resolution is 1920-1080 at nine megabits per second. So yeah. Um, and essentially, if you want any remote control of the camera, you do need to do the proxy recording simultaneously because we always uh, remotely are looking at the proxy file um, from from the remote side because it would take far too long to get access to the MXF in terms of transferring. Oh, that's a good point. You, uh, if you bring up um, or if you um, use the the box, then you can attach to a, the back of a non Sony camera or a Sony camera that doesn't have streaming. Um, mm -hmm. Do you get any of that kind of functionality then, or is it just going to send the, the proxy file, no operation control or anything like that? So a couple of the cameras with shoulder mounts will allow you to use USB connection, very limited in terms of the camera models though, but mostly yes, yes and no. So you wouldn't have remote control of the camera, but you can enable through the SDI output, depending on the camera model, a remote trigger. So when you start doing a record, or sorry, a record trigger. So when you start doing a record on that camera, it'll send a trigger through the SDI, which will be acknowledwed by the CBKW100, the little, the little box, right. um, to start a local record as a proxy. So that's the one that will have the SD card in there. It'll do a record. So yeah, you would then have access to that WA100, that little box, just how we would with our cameras here. So we would just see it here instead of a camera, we would show it as a WA100. Of course, you can name it whatever you want. Um, but yeah, you would then have access, just like you would with the cameras, as to pulling that proxy media right away. Um, and also getting the streams from as well. But yes, you're right. You won't have uh, any camera control per se. And, and so when you FTP files after the fact or during those those high res files are whatever is native to the camera, is that what comes through? Absolutely. Yep. So it's the native proxy file that's sent and uh, and the native MXF high res uh, files that are sent as well. So you and, get the full, full quality. 
and then the the um, uh, proxy files are the proxy files. You know, you don't have one for that's that's live, or you pull down at a different time, or when it's all over, it that you just set that up to be whatever the proxy file is for that project or that camera or something like that. Yeah, I, let me just jump in here a minute. I think there's a bit of confusion over here in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, live streaming versus the full resolution recording versus the proxy recording. Those are actually all three totally different things that are quite unrelated to each other. So you can be streaming even if you don't have proxy being created. The two are not dependent. You will determine what the resolution is of the stream by a by a parameter that we call the network range. And so that uh, so that our system is a little bit different than everybody else's. Uh, the question is, what happens if you're in a bandwidth constrained situation? Sure. Your, like your system's wanting to get eight or nine megabits per second, but all it can get is two. So most other systems will decimate the picture and they'll basically uh, lower the resolution. We don't do that. What we do is that we maintain the resolution, but obviously something has to give. And what we do is that we lower the frames per second. Now, that's not obviously a great strategy for something like uh, sports, but if you're doing interviews or uh, normal kinds of uh, news gathering, it's actually a very, very good solution. And, uh, you know, and, um, and uh, we maintain uh, uh, lip sync and we actually give audio presence over video. So, so what the what the decision that you have to make that people always ask that I can't tell you what to do is that well, am I better off in a constrained situation going for the higher bit rate or setting it for a lower bit rate? Well, it depends on what you want. Like for example, we have a target point that's about three megabits per second. At that point, the transport mechanism has nothing to do with what's actually going to be output. The output will be a full HD uh, 60i or a 720p, whatever it is that you uh, set yourself to. But in that case, the transport mechanism will be a, a standard F picture, basically. It'll be a uh, 640 by uh, 360 uh, matrix. Uh, it'll be a progressive picture at uh, 30 frames per second. So the question is, which do you prefer? Well, some people like that look better and other people will prefer, um, you know, uh, doing it at the full bandwidth, even though I can't get the pictures and then I'll just, uh, they'll just be uh, dropping some of the frames. And it actually looks very good. Uh, when the person's talking, you cannot tell the difference, but the background is a bit weird sometimes because the traffic gets uh, stuttery because it's going faster than what we can capture. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you guys work with uh, SRT? Or are you planning on incorporating that at any time uh, soon in an upgrade? So it's a good question. Uh, so it's not in the short term for the for the cameras. I know SRT Sony. I just um, talked about. Uh, implementing in the some of their PTZ cameras uh, so th so they're getting there um, but yeah definitely no SRT yet as of uh, you know within the next year at least with the with the NG cameras any other questions? Okay, I don't hear any more questions. Um, if everybody is okay, I'm gonna end up close up, closing the meeting here. But Martin, I wanna thank you very much for a presentation here. It's uh, uh, very interesting. And uh, oh, I'm gonna back up. I'll ask you one other quick question on there. You did mention that you can go to Live View TVU. Um, so the cameras, if you have an existing unit on, on premise, you can connect to that, is that? Uh, okay, so sorry, you want to just clarify the question a bit, sorry? Yep, so you, you had mentioned you, you integrate um, with the TVU and LiveView units. Um, 
can you just expand on that a little bit and how how that works? Uh, sorry, I think maybe I misunderstood when I said that. I, what I meant is uh, we work along side with the units, like not necessarily integrate together, but like we work with them, like in terms of the stations. So the stations will have live view, TV view, Gerald's or whatever, and then we have the Sony system as well that work, uh, you know, as as a separate system essentially, yep. but side by side. Um, but yeah, there is there are ways to work with it. So for example, I think uh, actually I actually have a meeting with live view tomorrow. Um, I think if they can take our TMP streams, there's a way that we can do that. And especially with some of the, the cameras that support our TMP streaming, now we can do that. But there's uh, it depends on the latency requirements. Um, we can also piggyback off um, live view and TVU for network. So some of them work as hotspots. So if you have a live view or TVU that you're using for uh, um, multicellular bonding, essentially, which we see in some trucks. So some trucks go out there and they're using live view as a hotspot that is then using five or six SIM cards to uh, send all that information back, uh, you know, to the station, essentially, or back to the internet. We can hop onto that network, essentially, by connecting these cameras to that hotspot that's been created by live view or, or TVU. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. So I appreciate okay. that. Um, it, it is two o'clock, everyone, and uh, again, thank you, uh, Jimmy, for organizing this. Uh, thank you, Martin, for, for presenting. Um, and I appreciate uh, all your input. And then there was one other guy from Sony, and I forget his name. Jonathan? Joe. 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 Yeah. Joe. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. So, thank you, Joe, for participating and, and adding to this as well. I appreciate it. Um, great presentation. So thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Um, this time, I'm going to close the, uh, the, the session so everybody has to get back to work. Um, again, thank you very much and uh, have a great day.